Hello, my name is Romina Arce, and I'm an interpreter just like you. I wanted to welcome you to this amazing training and tell you about the presentation that follows. It's the result of the amazing works of many, and it's not a biography. Instead, it's a glimpse into who these instrumental people were that gave so much to the interpretive profession that we know of today. I cannot stress enough, though, that this group of amazing people is not all-inclusive. In fact, there wouldn't be enough time, bandwidth, or space for such an endeavor. The information that's shared here does not belong to me either. It's strictly for educational purposes. Interpretation has been an instrumental part of our history since it began. Storytellers of old left their marks in caves, on rocks, and in hearts, and they still do. The history of interpretation is rather the history of us. And too many have forgotten that because life itself has become a distraction. Our existence is vital to the deep connection we have with nature, and this complacency is what keeps our souls asleep. Interpretation is the tool through which souls awaken. Interpreters at their core have always been guides. Guides for safety, security, shelter, as well as for belonging and self-actualization. Does any of this sound familiar? Abraham Maslow put into words what guides had already been doing for centuries when he penned his hierarchy of needs. But... Many of these original guides were accomplishing these concepts separately. Today, interpreters are masters at this, as they blend the guide of safety and security with the guide of belonging and self-actualization through well-thought-out storytelling and practiced interpretive skills. And that is why you are here, to follow in the footsteps of these remarkable guides that came before you. But... Who were they, and what did they do? Our history journey begins here with a familiar name, John Muir. Enjoy. God has cared for these trees, saved them from drought, disease, avalanches, and a thousand straining, leveling tempests and floods. But he cannot save them from fools. Only Uncle Sam can do that. John Muir changed the world with his words. I only went out for a walk and finally concluded to stay out till sundown. For going out, I found, was really going in.
John Muir died last year on Christmas Eve, one day after the bill to introduce Rocky Mountain National Park was brought into legislative consideration by the House of Representatives Committee on Public Lands. Mr. Muir is gone now, but his legacy only continues to grow. And I think of that when I think about the next generation and the generation after that, the children, like my own beautiful daughter Enda, and how a dream that was inspired by John Muir will span generations. I'm thinking of a day recently when some children were out playing. I would hear their cries and laughter, and then it seemed a bit silent, and I realized the children had returned to the Long's Peak House and wanted to seek me out. They said, Mr. Mills, we have found in the woods a beaver colony, and we're very curious. We want to understand these animals. Can you tell us about them? <laughs> well, I thought I could give a lecture about these animals, but let's go. And so with the children, I asked them to lead me to where they had found the beaver colony. And we walked through the brush, through a pathway, to a stream, and made our way to a small island. And there we built a makeshift raft. And we got aboard that raft in the water, and we acted out what we saw the beaver doing. We became these very animals that we were curious about, which we were studying. Nature as a classroom, a dream as big as a national park that will span generations. As I think about the children, I often wonder what it would be like if somehow we could gather together all of the children of the world in one place, and not only the children of our time, but the children of generations past, all the children that ever were. When we tell those children that there was a time and a place when good, sensible people came together in the preservation of nature to preserve the great wilderness treasures of humanity, I submit to you that those stories would set those children's hearts alight like no others, that there was a time and place when people saw the need to preserve and they acted. And places like Rocky Mountain National Park would be preserved for generations. This September, Rocky Mountain National Park will be formally dedicated into existence. And yet, I don't think in our lifetime we will have the span to appreciate what was done in our lifetime. Perhaps we need 25 years, perhaps 50, perhaps in 100 years we might have the span of time to realize what it was to dream a dream as big as a national park. Lastly, I have often been asked to impart an idea for those who are about to enter the wilderness, and I've often wished that there would be some suggestive sign or expressive quotation that might linger agreeably in the minds of all. I have often imagined that we all might, in our mind's eye, see the bended limbs above the arched and leafy entrances to the woods ever shaping themselves into these words, health and hope to all who enter. And that once within this magnificent place, we would hear the treetops whispering, these are your fountains. These are your gardens of life. Kindly assist in keeping them.
power opportunity now to find a device, any device, uh, in which we can promote these thoughts that I and, and, and uh, so many others have. When I first became acquainted with the uh, workings of the National Park Service, uh, and we were beginning to talk about interpretation, uh, a great many people said, uh, don't use the word education. People don't come to the National Parks to be educated. And they resent, the adults who come to the parks resent the idea that they need any education. Uh, as, as time went on, more and more we began to permit ourselves to take the role of educators. Interpretation uh, is, a, uh, at best, of course, uh, in the parks. Uh, a, 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 a uh, hopefully a, a pleasurable form of outdoor education. Now, what can what what can we do in that respect? You you know the difficulties. Uh, uh, everybody connected with the park service uh, knows the difficulties of uh, uh, this educational hope that we have. Uh, you can't preach to people in the parks. They don't like it. Uh, the most you can do is get them to thinking for themselves, uh, planting the seeds. The, the thing that people, uh, the thing that I, I would like as an interpreter, I would like to suggest to people right now, uh, and not through uh, parades or reduplicating the uniforms of the military and that sort of thing, was, uh, is somehow to suggest to them uh, that uh, we have gone far, but not always in the right direction. To look back over our history, uh, and not only look back, but feel back into our history, and decide what things we have done which are of permanent value, and where we have gone wrong. Now, uh, if you can do that, it's a vastly more importance than to uh, parade and celebrate, isn't it? diversity of the world's cultures reflects a corresponding diversity in the wilds that gave them birth. I think the core question of, of the modern practice of conservation is testing Leopold's idea. Is, is it possible for there be, to be this inevitable fusion between people to create a new kind of ethic? You know, and I've, I've staked my, my life and, and my career 
on the fact that it is possible. The work of conservation today is to build bridges. Um, build bridges between people and the land, but also between people and one another. That's Leopold's legacy for us. Leopold was born and lived and died in U.S., but it doesn't mean that he belonged just to U.S. And his idea is universal, and uh, it's very important. It's like Baikal Lake. Yes, it's inside Russia, but Baikal Lake the only one for the entire world, and means that it belongs to much more people than just the people from surrounding area. The urgency of environmental crisis in China really makes people think about the environment, people's relationship with nature more seriously. When we look at traditional Chinese culture, we could see some kind of remote resonance of a land ethic in traditional Chinese culture. And this land ethic, uh, uh, as expressed by Eldo Leopold, uh, was not uh, really unfamiliar for Chinese people. And uh, because his uh, that kind of humble and uh, holistic attitude toward nature was a part of Chinese vision, uh, vision of nature. I think it's uh, very natural for anybody to posit Leopold's land ethic to uh, Many, continent, many continents across the globe where people continue to strive to find this uh, balance between the way that they're living, the way that uh, the populations are growing and the demands uh, of the city dwellers are uh, increasing in, uh, in proportions which is way more than what the earth can sustain. So I think it makes uh, current sense to go back and revisit Leopold and also try and understand it with local contexts where people have been doing this uh, for uh, a very, very long time, for time immemorial. I interviewed Khmer um, refugees from the Pol Pot genocide who had been subject to torture, starvation, and forced labor in rice fields. And the first thing they wanted to do in America was grow a garden. And one of the, my translator, who was the nephew of one of the growers, said to me, um, they're not crazy. This is where they want to be because this is the thing that's kind to them. It doesn't speak to them in a foreign language. It speaks to them in their own language. So I think the idea of the land ethic, which is that the... It's a universal language, that is, if you know how to tend the soil, the earth responds. The human beings around you may not know how to pronounce your name. They may not understand your language. They may be alienated from you because they consider you a stranger and an outsider. But if you kneel down and plant the earth skillfully and pay attention to that piece of land, it will speak to you. It will respond. And I think that's the essence of the land ethic. In, 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 in Kenya, from where, where I come from, the Maasai communities traditionally own land communally. The now um, coming in of subdivision and parceling up of land into small uh, parcels of land and individualizing the ownership has brought, um, you know, people to start um, doing things um, in, in a bit selfish way, you know, a culture of um, individualization has, has cropped in. And, and, and that is um, a dangerous way to go for the pastoralists because the moment you start restricting that I have my farm and I want to graze in my farm, you, you cannot survive. You cannot be able to take your animals throughout the year. Elder Leopold saw the, the decimation of land and so he tried to go back to an earlier time in one sense, but using scientific metaphors that allowed him to reconstruct the relationship between people and the larger landscape. We're going through exactly the same in Africa today. Here you have Maasai who've lived in Africa for 3,000 years with cattle. They've maintained grasslands which are believed to be some of the most superb in the world with the highest population densities of wildlife anywhere. And yet suddenly in the course of 10, 15, 20 years, the land is being privatized, it's being subdivided up into small acreages, and because people are now sedentary on a very small site, they're degrading the land, and you can see it happening before your very eyes. The Indian has, has never considered land a commodity. That's not in his, his experience, not in his traditions. Uh, so when he encounters the idea that uh, land can be owned and that it ought to be it ought to be um, uh, 
used for the immediate uh, good of, of the state. Uh, this is a false idea, it's one that is alien to him. But we grow up in, in a society now in modern America where we have the idea that land is to be used and um, it, it, we, are, we are obligated in some way to, to take what is under the ground and use it for our immediate good. And we lose sight of the fact that there are people coming after us. The land ethic is, the, is an earth ethic. It's just that it was really articulated about the landscape that Aldo Leopold mostly knew and mostly worked in and was the reality for most of the people around him. But, uh, you know, you can't have land without sea. There wouldn't be any life on earth, so you need a land ethic and a sea ethic. It's all the same thing. And then you need an air ethic because we've learned in the last few decades that we're also really changing the atmosphere. So what is land, sea, and air? You know, it's, it's the earth, but it really is, it's the life ethic is really what it is. It's the life ethic. Uh, Leopold's thinking is universal. Leopold's thinking, although it, it grows out of an attachment to a place, its pertinence uh, goes beyond the place itself. And uh, the fact that his thinking, in a way, evolved out of his universal experiences in Mexico, in Germany, in the Southwest, in the Midwest, um, then it becomes relevant uh, to all the world.
or the public health service to take a closer look at this? Yeah, I, 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 and I know that they uh, already are. I think particularly, of course, uh, Ms. Carson's fork, but uh, they are examining the matter. think of her as a revolutionary, uh, it's rather startling. But in the sense of a change in our thought, uh, I think she was a revolutionary. You know, Rachel was my mother too, after my mother died. threat then to the survival of man is not chemical but biological in the shape of hordes of insects. pieces of an extremely complex jigsaw puzzle are at last falling into place. It is now possible to build up a really damning case. Silence prison are gross distortions of the actual facts, completely unsupported by scientific experimental evidence and general practical experience in the field. Particularly, of course, uh, it's Ms. Carson's fort, but uh, they are examining the matter. No one in either county farm office who was talked to today had read the book, but all groups of it puzzled. Ms. Carson maintains that the balance of nature is a major force in the survival of man, whereas the modern chemist, the modern biologist, the modern scientist believes that man is steadily controlling nature. Now, uh, to these people, apparently the, the balance of nature was something that was um, repealed as soon as man came on the scene. Or you might just as well assume that you could repeal the, the law of gravity. The balance of nature is built of a series of interrelationships between living things and between living things and their environment.
Interpretation is important because it allows us to build connections. Interpretation is important because I don't want people to forget. It helps a child's eyes light up at the sight of a new animal. Interpretation provokes you to care about something you might not have otherwise. It's connecting visitors to their surroundings. Interpretation is important because it connects the past with the future. And at the same time, it connects the future with the past. It helps people to care about the resources that we work every day to protect. To help audiences better understand their world. To facilitate the conservation and understanding of our heritage. To ensure that people who live today don't forget about the meaning of the sacrifice of yesterday. It not only helps us give people a sense of place, it gives them a sense of self. Interpretation is important because it leads to the heart of everything, including your resource and your visit. The importance of interpretation is summed up in the words given to us by Tillis. We provoke, we relate, we reveal. I like to use our history to help people understand that all the issues that we've dealt with in the past are still very much with us. My name is Chris Smith. I work at the Duke Lemur Center. My name is Jonathan Spring. I'm from New Zealand. I am Emily Castell, I, and I am the Associate of Brittany American Symmetry. My name is Luann Cadden, and I work for the Missouri Department of Conservation. I'm Rick Morales. I'm the founder of Jungle Treks in Panama. My name is Jess Corey, and I am the Curator of Education here at the Los Angeles Zoo. My name is Amy Erickson, and I work for Orange County Park. Well, I'm Chuck Lennox, NAI Region 10 Director and Principal of Cascade Interpretive Consulting. Soy Marisol Mayorga, a Professor of Interpretation in Costa Rica, and currently a PhD student at Kansas State University. My name is Toya Gervais, and I work for the Mountains Recreation and Conservation Authority in the Santa Monica Mountains. My name is Jordan McGuinn, and I'm a park ranger for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers at Tuttle Creek Lake in Manhattan, Kansas. Jeffrey Arneo, superintendent of the Brittany American Cemetery. I'm Bill Weldon. I work at Colonial Williamsburg. I am an interpreter. I'm an interpreter. I am 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 an interpreter. I'm an interpreter. I am an interpreter. I'm an interpreter. I am an interpreter. Well, friends, we have reached the final stop in our interpretive history journey. But your interpretive journey has only just begun. May the spark that ignited the fire within each of these remarkable people also become a blaze in you.